Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A very generous uh, welcome. Some uh, years ago, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger made an observation which I still believe has uh, a degree of validity now. He made the uh, comment that there were three extraordinary changes taking place in the global environment, political and economic environment. And these were the uh, European federal construct, what the EU was embarked upon, what China was embarked upon in terms of emerging as a very serious global player, and what was happening in the Middle East as a consequence of the growth of Islamic fundamentalism. Now, it's true that the uh, EU has hit hurdles, no question about that. Nonetheless, I think his observation about the EU and its future remains valid, though perhaps of less consequence than we might have thought a decade ago. Islamic fundamentalism is still there, but is a really a secondary or even tertiary threat in terms of non-state actors and, uh, and terrorism. It's been really replaced by the Arab Spring, the consequences which are working their way through Egyptian uh, politics and through the appalling circumstances in, in Syria. A long way to run, but the Arab Spring is real. And of course, in our own region, China has emerged as a major global player of consequence. But where are we now? Raymond Chandler was a, uh, a great uh, author. This is one of his best books. And I think it's the best way to describe the position which we currently occupy. We are in a period which is best termed the long goodbye. The long goodbye to the boom and the long goodbye to the global financial crisis. A long goodbye to speculation and, uh, and to easy money and hopefully a long goodbye to the consequences of the meltdown. It's also a long goodbye, ladies and gentlemen, to the politics of the New Deal, which has really characterised Western democratic endeavour since Franklin Roosevelt was elected in 1932 and convinced Americans, quite appropriately in my view, that government intervention in the wake of an economic crisis was the appropriate uh, way to go. Now, it was Theodore Sorensen, the superb speechwriter for President John F. Kennedy, who once declared that leadership was the quality in shortest supply in politics and government. No uh, a question about that. The current American uh, presidential election, in some respects, uh, would suggest that uh, Sorensen was right, particularly if you look at the alternative Republican Party contenders for the uh, nomination of their party for the presidency itself. I've no doubt that uh, both uh, Barack Obama, as he's demonstrated, and Mitt Romney in his previous political and business incarnations is more than capable of being the first magistrate of the American Republic, but leadership is in truly short supply in most Western uh, democracies. Bill Clinton used to say that being President of the United States was a little bit like running a cemetery. There were lots of people under you, but no one was really listening. <laughs> <coughs> now, people have been listening, ladies and gentlemen, in the last several months in the United States, as, uh, as everyone's aware. Their uh, a presidential election is a global ballot. It's just that the franchise is restricted to citizens of the United States. <coughs> Spare a thought this morning for the uh, citizens of the city of Las Vegas. It's estimated that since the 1st of June, the worthy citizens of Vegas have been bombarded with 71,000 political commercials. And that, of course, is uh, because of Nevada's key status as a battleground state. But a lot of the campaign has actually dodged the real issues for the US and indeed for the globe. In terms of the debt and deficit, the American uh, federal debt, the American budget deficit, really being the elephant in the room, and having been the elephant in the room for a very long time, through the, virtually the entire period of the Bush administration, and certainly 
during the Obama administration. And it's interesting that the only person in the campaign who had a comprehensive uh, program for reducing debt and deficit, that's Congressman Paul Ryan, who's of course the vice presidential nominee for the Republican Party, was told by Mitt Romney to say nothing about his plan during the course of the campaign. Uh, why? Because people are concerned on both sides of the American political aisle about the consequences of confronting constituencies with some very, very hard news indeed. And that's why one of the qualities most required in leadership is a degree of courage. Now, we're actually seeing the President as Commander-in-Chief exercise more than a passing degree of leadership just at the moment with the consequences of uh, Hurricane Sandy in the northeast of the United States. And quite a remarkable moment overnight where Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey, a Republican who's been very prominent in the Mitt Romney campaign, congratulated the President on the way he'd handled himself as Commander-in-Chief during the crisis, paid tri tribute to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency. Now, for every American voter, there is an automatic and immediate comparison in the mind, and that's with George W. Bush in Katrina. And I'd say that this is a, 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 another example of a great remark once made by Rahm Emanuel when he was Chief of Staff to President Obama. Uh, never miss the opportunity in a crisis. Where leadership is exercised, a very great deal uh, can be achieved. But it really comes down to three uh, elements in a crisis where leadership needs to be exercised. That's uh, clarity, consistency, leading to certainty. So it's all very well to, uh, to be canvassing opinion, it's all very well to be consulting, and it's clear the President has talked to governors and mayors about the uh, impact of Hurricane Sandy, but there are decisions being taken. And it's very clear those decisions will be argued out in the, uh, out in the public space. The President's quite, uh, uh, quite happy, it would seem, to leave a lot of the public space to governors and mayors to make the necessary announcements for their, uh, for their folks where evacuations are needed and so on and so forth. That's a sensible way to approach it. This is not a competition. It's not a, a contest for the public space. But I think we'll, we'll see as a consequence of, uh, of Hurricane Sandy and the, and the President exercising real uh, uh, power as uh, uh, Commander-in-Chief. While politics is off the front page in the United States for the moment, someone was making this comment to me earlier, the political consequences of President Obama's performance are going to be quite profound, well beyond the uh, states of the, the North East. This is a, uh, another example of massive change that's occurring in, in our world. The European federal prospect I mentioned earlier, now the hurdles that the European Union is having to overcome, given the meltdown in public finances and given the recession, which has overwhelmed most of the continent. And now, again in crisis, there's some humour always produced, always produced. Uh, the other morning in Sydney over breakfast, a Spanish banker was telling me a joke. I, th I thought it was very encouraging that a Spanish banker could still be telling jokes. <clears throat> in, a, in a burst of pan-European uh, sentiment, he was saying the Spanish banks are fine, you just have to worry about those Italian banks. Uh, <clears throat> he, um, he said it's, uh, it's afternoon. Uh, in uh, Berlin, it's a Friday afternoon, and the Chancellor comes back from a very hard day's work, and she says to her husband, "Look, I've really, uh, I've really had this. I mean, look at all the German papers; these editorials are critical of me. Not to mention the French and the British. I've nothing but opponents uh, uh, out there. Well, l let's uh, let's have a break." And uh, she turned to her chief of staff and said. Uh, uh, alert the Luftwaffe, we're, uh, we're leaving for the weekend. My husband and I are just packing some overnight bags. We'll be ready within the hour. And off they uh, uh, go out into the Aegean, fly out into the Aegean to a remote Greek island. And uh, uh, they look down. The island looks uh, uh, quite idyllic. There's some beautiful beaches, unspoiled, some vineyards, a couple of small villages. They duly land and the jet taxis to the end of the runway and... Uh, there's a somewhat run-down uh, customs house, the Greek flags hanging limply in the breeze, and out comes the customs agent. It's 
apparently hasn't had much traffic recently, but he's got his clipboard, and as the Chancellor comes down from her plane, the customs agent approaches her and says, uh, good afternoon, name? And the Chancellor said, Angela Merkel. And he said to her, occupation? No, she said, I'm only here for a couple of days. <laughs> Now it's always interesting to think what kind of uh, of, uh, of humour is at work in uh, in uh, in Europe at the moment. I, I underline that that was a joke. These days you have to, you uh, you have to underline uh, all the uh, political jokes as as being such. I actually believe that the European Union is is a good deal more robust than uh, some are suggesting. Jean Monnet, who was the founding uh, genius beyond, behind the ideal of uh, the, the common market, the coal and steel community. Uh, used to be uh, fond of saying that uh, nothing really begins without uh, men and women, but nothing endures without structures. And the key point about the EU uh, for the future is a political construct is now going to have sinews that are financial and budgetary, and a much stronger, uh, uh, much better governed banking system. All of that's emerging now. There will be arguments in the UK about how closely the UK will be involved. The French and the Germans in, are endeavouring still to hold their uh, particular relationship together. There'll be some disagreements with people uh, in Eastern Europe from time to time, and Spain and, uh, and Italy will uh, continue to be under some pressure. But I think the EU will muddle through. None uh, uh, the less, is it, uh, is it groundbreaking in terms of ideas? Yes. Uh, 150 years of European civil war from 1791 to 1945 produced the EU from Bonaparte to, uh, to Hitler. And it's astonishing the consequence of having a peaceful construct that endeavours to work together. So while we're looking at a, yet another crisis meeting in Strasbourg or, or so on, just remember the alternative of 100 years ago. And that's really been a, a consequence of uh, leadership that's been exercised. And while we'd like to see perhaps bolder steps taken, I think the EU will emerge in fundamentally uh, sound uh, order. But in terms of really Serious changes that are taking place, particularly in our region, we need only look uh, to the People's uh, Republic of, uh, of China. And I was thinking in terms of, uh, of, of leadership the other Saturday, I'm just out for a constitutional walk with the, uh, with the family dog in the local park in Sydney, cars parked down on the uh, water, and there was a massive uh, crowd, a massive crowd of, uh, of Chinese Australians gathered, and it was a, a festival day. And what was the festival day? They were celebrating the 40th anniversary of relations between Australia and the PRC. And the person most responsible for that was, of course, E.G. Whitlam, who took a delegation of senior ALP people, Mick Young and Tom Burns and a very young Steve Fitzgerald, to Beijing to talk to Zhou Enlai while he was leader of the opposition and was roundly criticised by the government of the day a, uh, an unlamented uh, Prime Minister by the name of uh, Sir William McMahon, uh, for being in Beijing and supposedly being played like a trout. That was McMahon's expression. It was McMahon who had uh, 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 some explaining to do when it was revealed a week or so later that Dr Henry Kissinger had been in Beijing almost at the same time, preparing the way for Richard Nixon's uh, visit as President of the United States prior to the reopening of diplomatic relations between the PRC uh, and, the, uh, and the US. But it took real courage on Whitlam's part, to do what fundamentally he knew was right and was in the national interest. And the fact that uh, we enjoy such a, uh, a, a close and successful relationship with the PRC is largely a consequence of that vision that Whitlam displayed way back in 1971 when it was uh, uh, quite unfashionable to argue for uh, closer relations with, uh, uh, with China. And it's interesting, uh, uh, Goff is... Uh, not enjoying the best of health these days, as uh, people are aware, un unfortunately. But it's always interesting at any major uh, function involving visiting uh, dignitaries from China over the years, Mr Whitlam was really the first person that people from the delegations sought out when he was in the, uh, in the audience. And that, that took very, very uh, real uh, courage at the, uh, at the time. The emergence of China, enormous economic change, as people are aware, enormous strategic challenges, particularly in the region, but, uh, but globally. We're seeing one of the extraordinary shifts. We're really seeing 
the end of the uh, uh, impact of the British Industrial Revolution and its replacement by the emergence of China, India, the other countries of the region as significant industrial and technological players. I'll make one comment in passing about, um, about the Industrial Revolution which began in Britain in the 1750s and what, uh, what drove it. If anything drove it, it was the steam engine invented uh, from memory by, uh, by James Watt, who to the end of his days believed that the best application for the steam engine was pumping water out of coal mines. Now that, that is actually a quite reasonable application. However, there was a fellow named Stevenson, named George Stevenson, as people remember from their school days, who actually thought through the implications of the steam engine and hooked it up to a locomotive and began the transport revolution, which then gave us effectively the uh, British and then the European and the, the global industrial city, gave us the urban working class, gave us the trade union movement, gave us the emergence of labour and social democratic political parties, then universal education, universal social security, so on. Quite extraordinary. But it was the linkage in Stevenson's mind of two seemingly unrelated objects. And that really, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the essence of intelligence. We're seeing the end of the consequence of the British Industrial Revolution and its replacement by something quite extraordinary uh, in our region. Of course, there are players. There are other players, and I'm talking now about the BRIC, Brazil and, uh, and uh, Russia, India and China. Other players economically, other players politically. This will cause, during the course of uh, this generation, a realignment in the United Nations Security Council, which currently still represents the victors of 1945. There is a great remark passed by President Lula of Brazil at a meeting of the G8 where he and some of the other leaders of the emerging or developing world were asked to come along to talk with the G8 about global economic policy. And he said, I'm really pleased to be here. It's a, it's a, a real privilege, You're very courteous to invite me. But of course, if I could point out, by 2030, most of the people at this table will no longer be here. And he was talking about the astonishing changes that are taking place in countries like India. Now, uh, India, of course, has hit a governance uh, uh, obstacle of, uh, of recent times. As Condi Rice is fond of saying, mm, progress in human affairs is not necessarily linear. Nonetheless, real, uh, uh, real and serious players in terms of not only of resources, but in terms of, 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 of technology, in terms of politics and diplomacy. And without mentioning anyone in particular, there are other kinds of challenges here, and I'm referring to challenges in cyberspace referring to uh, 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 powers that seek to, uh, to plunder in cyberspace. There's the traditional espionage, there are traditional me methods of industrial espionage, there are criminal gangs, and it is an entirely new dimension for us as leaders to be alert to these changes. I see in some of the boards on which I serve the real challenges that confront people on a daily basis when uh, people hostile in cyberspace are endeavouring to plunder your intellectual property or endeavouring to plunder your uh, bank accounts. These are real uh, challenges, requiring a certain flexibility. I'm going to finish, always on an upbeat uh, note, by just pointing to the fact that we should be confident about the uh, future. We've always been enmeshed in the uh, global system from the time that Arthur Phillips sent from the infant uh, colony to South Africa for marinas. We effectively became a global economic player when the American brig Philadelphia came up Sydney Harbour in 1792 with a cargo of meat for the infant uh, colony. When Bill Clinton spoke at the joint session of Parliament, he described the American meat as having been well cured by a six months voyage across the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> but nonetheless, we had become a global trader very early on. Think of the changes, ladies and gentlemen, that have overtaken Sydney the last decade since the Olympic Games. Sydney emerged as a global city as a consequence of the Olympic Games. My favourite uh, story about the Sydney Olympics is one told by Vince Sorrenti who said uh, that a member of the IOC was complimenting him on the hospitality shown him while he was in Sydney, particularly down at the Park Hyatt Hotel where the bathroom towels were so fluffy he could hardly get his suitcase closed. I'm, <coughs> I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, that's a joke too. Uh, <coughs> it was a great experience, but Sydney was then able to leverage and Australia was then able to leverage, and not only other great events like the Rugby World Cup or World Youth Day or APEC, 
But Sydney is now regarded as one of those cities that routinely is regarded as global, and that's particularly important in the Asian vertical at the moment, where we compete effectively, Hong Kong, Shanghai, with Singapore to a lesser extent, with Tokyo for business. So I think we can be confident. But as leaders, arguing for policy change, it does require, require clarity and a consistency. It does lead to a certainty. But it also argue at a time when there are more voices out there than ever in the technologies, it, there is a need constantly to be purposeful about what we do, to be persuasive about, uh, about what we do, and to be precise, to be precise. And the earlier we argue the case, the better. Mrs Thatcher was fond of saying as British PM, I don't usually quote Margaret Thatcher, but I think this is an appropriate quote. Some battles are so important they have to be fought more than once. And I think that's a uh, useful note on which to finish. Thanks very much. Thank you.